so welcome. Um, so this is the section where we're going to talk about what the fuck is Earn It. Um, this is the 2022 version of this webinar um, because time is a flat circle. And so we did this in 2020 and have now updated it for the 2022 edition. Um, I will kick us off with introductions. My name is Kate. Uh, I use she and they pronouns. I'm with an organization called Reframe Health and Justice. We work at the intersection of healing justice, harm reduction, and criminal legal reform. And uh, my background is sex worker organizing, advocacy, capacity building, and training and technical assistance. And I will pass it over to Blunt. Hey everyone, my name is Blunt. I am an organizer with Hacking Hustling, a collective of sex workers, survivors, and accomplices working at the intersection of tech and social justice. And I'm also a sex worker. And I'll pass it to Kendra. Hi everybody, um, my name is Kendra Albert, uh, they, them pronouns. I'm an attorney at the Harvard Law School Cyber Law Clinic. Um, I am not your attorney, um, but I am a attorney. Um, and uh, I work on sort of issues related to technology, sex work, um, sort of free expression and advocacy online. Um, and super, super, I mean, I would say I I'm excited to be here because I'm always excited to share space with folks. Um, but, you know, honestly, I think we all wish we kind of weren't doing this. Uh, so, you know, uh, on that exciting note, um, Mariah, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. All right. Um, oh. We can come back to Mariah. Um, so um, I think I'm up first. So I'm going to do my best to walk us through like, what is Earn It? Like, what does this bill do? Um, and with a spe special emphasis on the things that have changed between the last time we did this, the 2020 version, and now. So there's three main things I want to emphasize about how Earn It makes changes to the law. And the first of them in some ways is like kind of the weirdest. Um, it comes from the fact that previously Earn It sort of was trying to uh, build best practices for producing child sexual abuse material, CSAM. Um, you'll hear us use that acronym, um, also sometimes known as child porn, previously sometimes known as child pornography. Um, and so as part of this effort to sort of re reduce CSAM or sort of set up guidance that platforms are supposed to use to reduce CSAM, EARNIT sets up a best practices commission. And this is sections three and four of the bill if you're following along with the text. Um, it's a 19 person commission headed by the attorney general. Um, and it has this very broad mandate to develop best practices, not just around sort of CSAM and um, reducing the sort of production and distribution of CSAM, but around child sexual exploitation more broadly. And that's not a that's not a term that's necessarily defined by this statute, but I think we can understand it as both including CSAM, but other sort of uh, sort of uh, potentially including other kind of harms that folks might think of as related, but not the same as well. Of this commission, 11 of the members are taken from federal agencies, including law uh, and law enforcement and tech companies. So this includes, you know, folks, uh, organizations like the Department of Homeland Security, tech companies, the FBI, you know, the FTC, there's a whole bunch. Um, and uh, four of the members would be survivors of child sexual exploitation or those supporting survivors. Um, so I think, you know, we don't necessarily know who those four would uh, be. The process by which these folks are appointed is actually through, I think it's the Senate, the House, and there's, um, I think there's a, the Attorney General also appoints some people. Um, and then four of the people on the commission would have a civil rights, civil liberties, privacy, or cybersecurity background. So this commission is sort of set up to sort of go provide best practices for reduction of CSAM. They have a pretty broad mandate, including things like age gating. So considering whether um, certain material, certain uh, websites should um, uh, uh, restrict who is able to access them based on, based on age information. And a change from earlier versions of the bill um, is that the recommendations of these best practices commission don't have the force of law. There's not any particular legal requirement that platforms follow them. Nonetheless, um, you know, judges or other you know, folks who are thinking about policy may look to what these best practices are um, in terms of uh, sort of developing what they think of as the appropriate practices. And it's worth noting that, you know, the expertise of this committee does not include sex worker advocates, you know, LGBTQ organizations, you know, folks who do sort of primarily like child advocacy outside of the framework of sort of the survivors of child sexual exploitation. 
Um, and I think that's a one something we see as a key flaw in the way that this commission is developed. But I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm supposed to just be talking about sort of the actual bill as opposed to the flaws. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So the next part of the bill is probably the one that's gotten the most attention quite reasonably. Um, it's bec that's because it has bears a striking symbol uh, similarity to FOSTA SESTA, right? Um, so Earn it removes what's called Section 230 immunity. So for those who are have managed to remain blissfully unfamiliar, um, Section 230 is basically a law that prevents online platforms being, from being held liable for their speech of their users. So what that means is that you know you can't sue Yelp if someone uh, defames your restaurant by posting a bad review. You can only serve, serve the you can only sue the person who posted the bad review. Of course, we're not talking about restaurant reviews here. Um, so this removal of 230 immunity is in some ways similar to what we saw for FOSTA. FOSTA was a removal of 230 immunity for certain types of claims regarding sex trafficking. Um, this one removes platform immunity for civil suits from the for the distribution of CSAM. So let me unpack that a little bit because like that's a bunch of legal terminology. So it's worth noting that Section 230 has never, never prohibited the Department of Justice from going after online platforms that they believe are engaging in behavior that violates federal criminal law. So, you know, and that includes the federal criminal laws that prohibit the distribution um, uh, of child sexual abuse material. What removal of 230 immunity does is it creates the ability for individuals to bring those same kinds of suits against platforms for distribution of CSAM. Um, and what that means is often that even if no one would actually win those suits, right, even if they would get thrown out, um, uh, they are not, you know, they would, they might make it further along in the legal process than they would currently. Earn it also removes platform immunity for civil and criminal cases using that using state laws regarding conduct related to CSAM. And if you're confused about what this, this means, uh, join the club, because uh, it's actually pretty unclear what laws would be in scope. It turns out there's a lot of uh, state laws, both civil and criminal, um, that sort of use or are related to the federal definition of CSAM. Um, and so that this may subject platform to a wide array of state laws that we may not fully understand sort of the contextual nature of, and that's been concerning for folks. One other sort of change to earn it this cycle is that there's a statement in the bill that says providing end-to-end -end encryption shall not serve as an independent basis for liability. So theoretically, what this means is that um, it's meant to prevent encrypted services from being sued merely because they can't possibly know about the CSAM that's sort of on their platform or prevent its distribution because the services are encrypted. However, um, this provision is significantly watered down from the 2020 version, which is really striking because the 2020 version was not good um, and is just pretty unrealistic to how uh, these suits would actually be brought in the first place. And so I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A if helpful. Let's go to the next slide. There's also just a whole bunch of other stuff in this bill. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. Um, one of the things is it changes the, the world's child pornography and a whole bunch of federal civil or federal laws to child sexual abuse material. Um, it, they're meant to mean the same thing. Uh, you know, don't read too much into that. It also expands the type of information that parties, aka online platforms, are expected to send to NICMIC, the National Center on Missing and Exploited Children, when reporting potential instances of CSAM. It's worth noting here that it doesn't require platforms like collect additional data, right? But it does um, it does uh, require the inclusion of that data if platforms have it. And I think most notably and concerning to many survivors of child sexual abuse, it allows report providers. So this is online platforms to indefinitely retain CSAM so long as it, that the CSAM they retain is used to reduce or prevent CSAM distribution. Um, which is a change from the, the current law where they're only, I believe, allowed to retain it for 90 days. Um, let's go to the next slide. So as you may have remember from 2020, um, we kind of contextualize this in terms of the broad expansions of sort of civil and criminal liability for like third parties um, related to things that people are scared of, aka, you know, <laughs> Uh, child sexual abuse and, you know, in the context of uh, SESTA-FOSTA, sex trafficking. 
Um, so in 2014, we saw efforts to use the banking and finance system um, to sort of limit sex workers' ability to advertise and use cash payment services, sometimes under the guise of preventing trafficking and sometimes just very explicitly in a way that was anti folks who were folks in the sex trades. Um, next slide. Or next bit. Uh, in 2017, we saw the same effort to go after transportation and hotels, right? Thinking of them as people who could start reporting this information and sort of uh, cracking down on the people who are using these services um, as a way of sort of surveilling or doing what might not have been sort of politically viable or easy to do otherwise. Um, and then in 2018, of course, we saw the same thing with SESTA FOSTA. Instead of actually doing anything to reduce the circumstances that cause trafficking or the harms of folks that experience in the sex in se the sex trades, lawmakers expanded criminal and civil liability for internet platforms. And you know, obviously, as pretty much everyone here knows, basically destroyed um, the market, the sex trade as they existed previously. Um, so. I want to just highlight some of the changes from last time because you know I know some folks have been sort of following along and I feel feel like it's a little unclear sometimes what's changing. Um, from the earliest versions of Earn It, we now have the commission outputs be not are they're non-binding. Platforms are not required to follow them. On the other hand, I think it's still likely that courts may choose to look at the results of the commission to guide what is considered the best practices for the space. Um, and so, although I'd like to pretend that the commission is unlikely to have sort of real power, I think they're very much going to set uh, some level of sort of standards or expectations, even absent any force of law. The other thing, another thing that's changed is the encryption protections actually got worse from the bill that passed markup in 2020, um, you know, exploding head emoji. Uh, so the version of the encryption amendment that's in the current bill is basically likely almost useless for any serious end-to-end -end encrypted service provider because it only eliminates uh, the use of encryption as an independent basis of liability. And realistically, if you're bringing a lawsuit um, about regarding a distribution of CSAM on a platform, you're probably going to you know, name everything you could possibly think of as related to that, not just name encryption in particular. And of course, you know, the key point here uh, that we, I think we always just sh should highlight, especially as we sort of go through all this nitty gritty, is it's actually still unclear how any of this will actually solve or reduce CSAM related problems. There have been a number of concerns from folks about uh, potential, the way this may actually make it more difficult for law enforcement to prosecute certain kinds. Um, but the, uh, the, um, but what's really just striking here is that, you know, the new version of the bill doesn't really deal with most of the critiques that folks like Hack and Hustling and others have made. It sort of just doubles down on the same kind of strategic, um, strategic plan. So I'll stop there and I think let us turn over to talking a little bit about what's wrong with it. I already did that a little bit. We're going to talk more about what's wrong with it. There's a lot wrong with it. So we're going to continue talking about what some of the problems are. And as folks are mentioning in the chat that this earn it would impact so many different communities, just like we saw with FOSTA SESTA. So to give a little bit of history, on April 11th, 2018, Congress passed FOSTA SESTA, which expand platforms, criminal and civil liability around human trafficking, which was what Kendra was talking about with Section 230. Um, within 20 minutes of the bill being signed into law, platforms responded. They wanted to avoid potential civil suits. And because of the vagueness of the way this is, these laws are written and the moral panics that are created with their writing, um, plat what we see is that platforms are over responding. So with FOSTA SESTA, we saw websites coming down within 20 minutes. We, we lost tons of advertising websites. We lost hosting. We lost spaces to share community harm reduction information. And because of the desire of platforms to avoid um, the increased liability, they are over policing what is defined as a sex work. And so we're seeing a lot of queer content coming down, a lot of trans health information as well, and a lot of the harm reduction information and the resources that we use to advertise, to make money, to make rent and to stay safe. Um, so in the last, wow, four years, um, this is all, a this is all wild to me. And between 
2018 and 2022, platforms continue to alter their terms of service. We've seen a lot of changes in the way platforms are moderating content, how they're closing accounts, and this compromises our harm reduction, community building, advertising, and our safety. Um, post FOSTA SESTA, we saw an increase in violence, an increase in homelessness, an increase in folks who are working on the street. And I think it's important to note that many people who trade sex who have access to it are using the internet as a form of harm reduction in and of itself. Um, and multiple unfounded lawsuits were filed and other anti-LGBTQ sex trade organizations um, compounded the problem as well. Um, next slide. I think this one's me. So just to sort of reiterate some of what we said earlier about why this is a problem, you know, I think the just clearest thing here is that online platforms can already be prosecuted under federal criminal law if they're engaged in the knowing distribution of child sexual abuse material. You know, uh, sponsors of the bill have sort of made the claim that this is about going after the worst of the worst, right? This is not going to impact sort of these regular platforms who are just, you know, may people may happen to use to share CSAM, but the reality is that just as you know, um, Backpage was sued, crim like sued prior to FOSTA SESTA's uh, signing. You know, the Department of Justice already actually has the legal tools to go after sort of bad actors in the child sexual abuse space, and we really haven't seen them do that, right? Yeah, um, and you know, this bill changes uh, this by making these plat making platforms potentially liable under state at criminal and civil law. And so far, you know, what we've seen with FOSTA is that these are not, you know, folks may be bringing claims because they are unable to sort of get restitution and unable to get the financial support that they need. But the waves of lawsuits that have happened post FOSTA have not resulted, resulted in sort of a safer environment for anybody, really. Um, and also what we know from FOSTA is that platforms will likely remove content in order to reduce their potential liability of civil suits, which they know are coming. And what's worth noting here is that the types of removals of sexual content that we saw post FOSTA, um, as well as non-adult content written by sex workers or people who are profiled as sex workers, um, were basically totally disproportionate to the actual legal risk platforms were running. And so I think this is the same thing that we're concerned with earn it, which is that even though actually, you know, the content consequences or the context in which platforms might be held liable for uh, child sexual abuse material are actually quite narrow, it still, you know, expansion of liability still may cause huge ripple effects in terms of uh, the removal of content in order for platforms to sort of just be able to say that they've done everything that they can. Um, you know, as we say here, right, this is like might include things like crackdowns or additional surveillance of private messaging or accounts. We honestly don't really know. And that's part of why so these bills are so harmful. Um, and, you know, how do we know that this stuff might happen? Um, you know, how does your Twitter account doing, right? We've seen the effects of these sort of platforms externalizing the cost of, you know, think their fear of liability on by kicking off sex workers and other folks that um, they just don't think of as important enough. Um, and then, you know, we, it is also quite likely, I think, under the way that the bill is currently constructed, and frankly, around the sort of moral panic and discourse, as Blunt was highlighting, that online platforms might increase scanning for sexual content, as, as well as sort of excluding anyone who's engaging in any type of discussion of sexual material online in order to reduce the likelihood that some that some of that might be sort of related to people under the age of 18. So I think we're on the next slide. And so I just wanted to address something that I was seeing in the chat. Um, Backpage actually came down a week or so before FOSTA SESTA was signed into law. So despite the bill makers championing back page and besides what you're seeing in the incorrectly reported news that FOSTA SESTA took down back page, this law was not actually necessary to do what the bill was created to do. There were other mechanisms that they were able to go after back page and that they've gone after Rent Boy and various other sites that sex workers use to advertise. Um, so FOSTA SESTA asked platforms to assess their liability around the sex trade and turned everyone that was profiled into a sex worker into a serious liability and earn it would broaden that impact. We're already working around 
um, that there is the platform's assessment of liability and it's destroying how we advertise, build community, share harm reduction information. Um, all of this is exacerbated within the context of a pandemic where many of us have turned to online work um, and are using the internet to build community when seeing people in person becomes much more difficult and risky. Uh, without encryption, our interactions with clients and communities are at higher risk of being monitored by law enforcement. And the commission, like Kendra was talking about, lacks representation, oversight, transparency, and is primarily about law enforcement creating rules for digital spaces. So earn it is about increasing policing and does nothing to actually address CSAM or provide resources to communities. So we also know that earn it is going to disproportionately impact other communities as well. Um, and the way that we know that is by looking over the last couple of years. Um, there's been a number of, of different reports, article studies about how cracking down on what is considered an adult content, especially when you're filtering it through bots, when there isn't necessarily expansive uh, human-based customer service that's um, looking at a lot of this stuff, what we see is that when you have anything that might remotely be related to, to sexuality that could be potentially adult content, um, it's getting flagged. And uh, very specific communities are being disproportionately impacted by that. So first and foremost, we wanted to name that LGBTQ communities and especially young queer folks are being really affected by these parental controls. And when we think about what Earn It is gonna do, when we look at the commission that was developed, you know, those are determining parental controls. Those are determining things like age gating and age rating. They're using this broadly and sometimes nebulously defined term grooming, and that's going to be considered on platforms. Um, and so what we see is that when there are recommendations, especially when they are broad recommendations, and that was true, you know, as Kendra was talking about in 2014, that was the Department of Treasury putting out kind of broad recommendations and having it impact uh, folks on the ground differently than was uh, originally envisioned. Whether we're talking about Department of Homeland Security developing trainings for hotels and motels that is leading to people getting the cops called on them. When you have these broad recommendations and then they get interpreted by companies, especially around their best practices and liability, what happens is the same communities end up suffering. So this was an article that just came out um, only a couple of weeks ago that said that looked at top parental controls. It was based in the uh, United Kingdom in response to some of their uh, recent laws um, that, that touch on this topic, 92% wrongly blocked uh, LGBTQ content. And that when we were looking when they were looking at it, that was things like um, you know, uh, information about Stonewall. There was also the Trevor Project, which was a crisis intervention line that's really specifically for trans young folks. Um, and we know the impact of not having access to that information. And when you're talking about things like the Trevor Project, when you're talking about young people understanding, you know, their own identities, what happens is isolation. It's internalizing the stigma that happens. It's allowing the uh, anti-LGBTQ material to proliferate while things that are building community and building affirming lives is blocked. Second, and there was a really amazing letter put out uh, against earn it and it was specific to the needs of immigrant communities um, and this quote was actually directly pulled from the letter that was sent to several senators and entered into the record entered into the congressional record by one of those senators and says for immigrant communities these two bills could mean even more intrusive surveillance that could accelerate uh, deportation and the breakup of families and they're really talking about the need for encryption and the importance of um uh, of those kind of protected ways of communication that are especially important to marginalized and policed folks who really seek out digital space for safety, just like sex workers. Um, this is an article that came out of the New York Times, um, I think five weeks ago, and what it found that other folks who are impacted are people with uteruses seeking health information. And so these are 60 different companies that are really focused on uh, women's sexual health um, being cited as adult products or services, saying that they were promoting um, that re promoting reproductive health products like contraception um, must be targeted to people 18 years or older and must not focus on sexual pleasure, which can you imagine the last time that someone said that something about uh, 
uh, folks without uteruses have to not speak about sexual pleasure. And then of course, and especially in the crosshairs right now is people seeking abortion care. And especially for young people seeking abortion care, this is so direly important. Um, I, 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 num I imagine a lot of people on this call remember that only a few months ago, Texas passed one of the most uh, stringent uh, abortion bans in the entire country. And right around that time also, Instagram suspended uh, 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 an organization called Plan C, which is a site that has, um, it's one of only a couple sites that has really robust information about self-managed abortion care. Um, self-managed abortion is a type of abortion care that folks can get, um, which involves pills, which means you can take it at home, which is why it's called self-managed. Um, and especially when you don't have an abortion provider within 100, 300 miles of you, that all of a sudden becomes that much more important. But just like FOSTA SESTA, that uh, the Texas abortion ban included a civil um, a provision, which also expanded civil liability for folks that were helping people get and, and providing abortions. And so what happened immediately was there was a crackdown on websites that were providing information to help people access abortions. And especially when we're looking at what's about to happen with Roe v. Wade uh, at the Supreme Court, what we're really talking about is that seeking abortion care is be gonna become that much more difficult, that much more criminalized, that much more dangerous. And just like how removing that information makes sex workers unsafe and vulnerable to violence, removing abortion care information makes especially young people less likely to seek out and, and be able to access safe abortions. Um, and so we just wanted to highlight some of the different ways that this is, um, we anticipate that this is gonna move and have an impact on a lot of different spaces. And so that's where, and I see there's already a couple uh, questions in the chat, but we are going to um, end the recording.